Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, Finance Friday Edition, where we interview Remy and talk about becoming real estate ready. I would love to invest in real estate. The area that I live in is a high cost of living area. So property tends to be relatively high with most investment loans being 25% down. That's a significant chunk of money that I would have to save up. Mostly looking at this as a 10 to 15 to 20 year uh, return basis. Like how do I get from here to there? I think I'm in a relatively good position to be a millionaire by the time I'm 35. I'm not keen on making a move on my home, my, my current primary residence, but considering you know it could have a big financial impact on my positioning, is that something I should consider? Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my nerdy co-host, Scott Trench. 3.14159, mathletes do it all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. Please tell me you had that on a t-shirt. No, I, 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 unfortunately not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet is right. Christmas is coming, Scott. Trenches tease. Yes. <laughs> that was one of my first business ventures that lost a large amount of money. Um, every once in a while, somebody views the Trenches tease Facebook site or something like that. I don't think there's anything for sale, though. Oh, you should make them. We should talk afterwards, Scott, because you can, instead of buying inventory, you can just have it ready for somebody to order. Mm. We're going to do that. I'll make you a millionaire. All right. <laughs> Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, or start your own t shirt business, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Start your own t shirt business. That is a story for a different day. Today, we're talking to Remy, and Remy would like to start investing in real estate. So we are going to get him real estate ready. But before we do, my attorney makes me say the contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither Scott nor I, nor Bigger Pockets, is engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should seek your own advice from professional advisors, including lawyers and accountants, regarding the legal, tax, and financial implications of any financial decision you contemplate. We want to welcome Remy to the show. Remy is 26 and January 2023 is going to be a big month for him. His PMI drops off his mortgage and his car payments end, freeing up about $700 a month, which is good because right now his biggest pain point is cash flow. Basically, he doesn't have any, due in large part to living in a high cost of living area. Remy, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm excited to talk to you as well. Thanks for having me. Well, let's jump into your numbers. I see a salary of about $5,600 a month, additional income, $650 in rent from your girlfriend, $100 a month from fitness coaching, and a bonus that is generally 20% of your salary paid in a lump sum at the end of the year, which is where we are right now. Monthly expenses are about $5,500 a month. That's where that cash crunch is coming from. A mortgage of $2,076, including property taxes and $192 in PMI, which we just said is going to be leaving in January. HOA of $269 a month. Utilities, $200. Homeowners insurance, $276 a year. Gas, $180 a month. Restaurants, $250. Subscriptions, $6. Nice job on keeping that low. Gym, $120. Shopping, $150. Car, $500 a month. Again, ending in January. Car insurance, $1149 a year. Bars, $120 a month. Phone, $45. Miscellaneous, $500-ish with a question mark. So you know I'm going to come back to that. Groceries, $400 a month. Uh, average monthly spending this year is $5,500 a month. And like you said earlier, you have some big CapEx numbers this year, which should go away next year. $7,000 for a furnace. You don't get a furnace every year. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, some tw uh, house renovations, dog vet bills. So overall, I don't see anything remarkable in your expenses. Uh, investments, we have $15,000 in an after-tax brokerage, $4,400 in a Roth IRA, $60,000 in a 401k split between a traditional and a Roth, $4,000 in a retirement health plan, $30,000 in a cash position that you said was an emergency fund, $5,500 in an HSA, $3,000 in crypto, which I believe is about $3,000 too much, 
320000 in a mortgage at 3.125% interest, which is an awesome interest rate, a $1,500 car loan at 4%, which will be paid off in January. So, Remy, what does your money story look like and what are your biggest pain points and how can we help? So my money story really starts probably when I was pretty young. Uh, my parents always did pretty well uh, my, until my father lost his job in the kind of the financial crisis of 08, uh, kind of struck a chord with our family, uh, led to not a big financial rift, but uh, significant enough where it caused some pain points in our life. Um, when I got to college, I started to study finance, uh, took a financial planning course, realized a lot of the things that uh, most people get in trouble with were pretty easily avoidable. Um, so I started doing that. I, I now work for a relatively large financial institution where I try and help a lot of people with that, uh, or uh, we try and help a lot of people with that. So uh, that's really where my money story lands. Awesome. What are the um, prospects for your current career? Your situation strikes me as one where you've got great money fundamentals. There are no glaring issues here, but you are treading water is my my initial my re re reaction. You're not accumulating a large amount of cash and that seems to be, jump out at me, as, as the primary issue we need to discuss today is how do we ignite that, that engine of cash accumulation so that you can begin investing? One component of that is your job. You may be at this financial institution doing a role that is likely to translate into significant um, income growth in the next three to five years as you advance through the ranks there, or you may be kind of just kind of, uh, you, you, may, you may not be clear on that. So that, that, that has a major impact, I think, on, on the remaining part of the discussion. That's why I'm asking that question. Sure. So my career prospects as they sit right now, uh, I'm in a great position to advance in my career, uh, currently looking at positions within my company to move around, uh, probably not necessitating a huge increase in, in salary or increase in pay in general uh, over the next year or two. Uh, but the prospects are good for probably 25% earnings growth over the next 10 years or so. Uh, so a really good position to uh, start to accumulate more uh, salary income, more bonus income uh, over the next few years, especially as the pay grades start to get higher. Uh, my company tends to do more bonus-based compensation. So the salaries grow relatively steadily, but the bonuses increase uh, significantly. So uh, that's really where a lot of uh, folks in my company start to make uh, very good money as they advance. Um, and, and where do you want to be in the next couple of years? What's the best way we can help you? I guess there are a couple of things there, so tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the best way that I'm, that I'm thinking you can help me today is positioning myself to where I can get real estate ready. So I would love to invest in real estate. Uh, the area that I live in is a high cost of living area, so property tends to be relatively high um, with most investment loans being 25% down. That's a significant chunk of money that I would have to save up. Um, mostly looking at this as a 10 to 15 to 20 year, uh, return basis. Like how do I get from here to there? Um, I think I'm in a relatively good position to be a millionaire by the time I'm 35. Um, but is there positions that I could take to accelerate that sort of thing? Uh, you know, I have a high equity position in my home for only having it for two years. Um, so I'm looking at is that something that I want to make a move on? I'm not keen on making a move on my home, my, my current primary residence, um, but considering you know it could have a big financial position, uh, financial impact on my positioning, um, is that something I should consider? That sort of thing. Well, great. I, I think I think what I would love to do is start with the basics and look at you know what it, how much cash you're going to accumulate on an annual basis, given your current income and your current expenses. Um, and go through that because that, that I think is, is important here. Um, I'd love to look at the prospects for growth in your job within the next 12 months as well. And then, yeah, I think that's right. Let's, let's take a look at the house and the housing um, situation. And, and there's some, there's some ideas there. Um, so that's not, that sounds great. Do you want to start with expenses and Mindy, do you, do you have anything that, that jumps out to you? I have a couple of things that, that jump out at me and they are insurance. Your homeowner's insurance feels low at 276 a year. So typically a mortgage will be principal interest taxes and insurance. I want to make sure that you're not double paying insurance. And if you aren't double paying insurance, like I think mine is $600 a year and I go for a super high deductible. 
So my house is a little bit more expensive than yours, but it isn't like, I don't think that is the, what really generates the, the uh, cost of the homeowner's insurance. And I have like, I asked for a $25,000 deductible and my insurance company or my mortgage company made me drop it down to 10,000. Um, but I think yours is really, really low. So I would just double check that your homeowner's insurance is actually 276 a month. Your car insurance, on the other hand, seems kind of high. You are younger than me and you're male, but at 26, your car insurance should drop significantly. Also, if you get married, your car insurance should drop again. I would have that requoted, especially if you've been with the same company for a while. Now that you are older in quotes um, and more mature and responsible, you should see a deduction in a reduction in your annual cost. I would also, uh, what kind of car do you have? Do you have like a fancy car, a sports car? Or do you have like a boring car? I have a Jeep Grand, Grand Cherokee. Okay. That might be uh, big on the theft list, which would increase your car insurance. But also I think that you should just get it requoted because that seems kind of high. Um, and different areas of the country have different costs. Um, but overall, I would wonder what that 500 in miscellaneous is. I don't see a lot of really crazy expenses. Could you give us information about what the homeowner's insurance is? Sure, exactly. That's where I was going next is the in the two insurance pieces. So the homeowner's insurance at $276 a year. Uh, I'm sorry if I said a month. Um, a year is the is the quote that I, or the um, the payment that I make. Uh, that is for the interior of my condo. So um, my HOA covers a master insurance policy for the building. So in the event of uh, fires, floods, that sort of thing, it protects my my property value, my home insurance or my home value. Um, the property on the inside, which is like couches, furniture, TVs, um, you know, toys that are inside, like that kind of stuff, is covered on the home insurance. That's two hundred and seventy six dollars per year, and I think about, I believe I have fifty thousand dollars in coverage. That being a condo explains a lot. Okay. Do you have $50,000 worth of stuff? That's the minimum. Yeah, I believe that's the minimum. Yeah. I argued with my condo insurance company as well. I'm like, I have like $1,000 worth of stuff in here. They're like, well, it would cost more to get it back. So so here, here here's where, so and, and this is going to be, this is going to, you know, probably get some people fired up, but like, I, I at 26, I didn't have $50,000 worth of stuff in there. The most valuable thing I owned was my suit uh, at that point and my computer. So um, if this is not required, maybe you don't, you don't have it. I, I don't think it's something that I would have done at that point. I, I don't think I, you know, I, I guess I do have renter's insurance now. I'm a renter, um, which, which, which covers some of the same things, but something to consider. Interesting. Okay. Scott, I think we should applaud him for having a, approximately $120,000 in investments. Oh, yeah. Even though 3000 of that is crypto. Sorry, we should we should take a moment and say you're doing great. Um, there's a lot of fundamentals that are going really wonderfully here. I just jump immediately with my brain to okay, problem here, not having enough cash flow. Let's go, let's go ahead and attack it. Um, but yes, we should take a moment and say you're you're doing fantastic. You you clearly are on a path to become a millionaire by 35, like you said. Um, you know, assuming the market gives us reasonable historical tailwinds. Um, so I think things are a lot of a lot of things going right. Hope you can forgive us for going straight into the the issues here. Sure. Yeah. And and uh, if I can just clarify a little bit on the cash flow. So I, you listed the income as fifty six hundred a month. Uh, most of that is dictated by the fact that I over the you know maybe up until about four or five months ago had been socking a lot of my income away into retirement accounts. Thus the relatively high income or I'm sorry investment balances. Um, so. My gross income for a month is right around ninety one hundred dollars a month, and after backing out things like uh, health insurance, four hundred one k Roth, uh, HSA balances, it comes back down to about fifty six. So I intentionally do that as sort of a forced scarcity metric. Uh, I have since kind of reallocated some of that to try and accumulate more of a cash position, and especially now that uh, some of these big payments are going away, like the car and the PMI. Uh, I'm really considering how much of that I'm putting into Roth, especially if I'm considering financial independence at, you know, say 35 or 40 versus, um, you know, the traditional 60. Love it. I mean, that's a great, that we should talk about that. That's a great um, situation or, or, or challenge there. You're, you're right in this frustrating spot um, of having a good income <clears throat> and having pretty, pretty reasonable expenses associated with that, but being forced to make trade-offs 
that are hard for a mathematically oriented person who works at a large financial institution um, to, to, to consider there, right? You either can put it all into your tax advantaged accounts, or you can put it into cash. Um, cash has, ob has less obvious, more subtle, but very, very powerful advantages in enabling r future real estate opportunities, flexibility, and those types of things. And the tax advantaged accounts have very clear quantifiable uh, value that you can put into your spreadsheet very nicely. Um, it all depends on where you want to end up in that 15 years, in, those, in, in 10, 15 years, and what you want that portfolio to look like. So let's, let's start with that question. What do you want that portfolio to look like? <clears throat> you have a you have million and a half dollars at age 37, let's call it. What's the dream portfolio? I'd say the dream portfolio is probably about two or three investment properties uh, generating somewhere in the order of a few thousand dollars in monthly cash flow, I, I think is pretty reasonable to say, maybe three or four thousand dollars in monthly cash flow. That's reasonable if the properties are very lightly leveraged. So you have a very high equity position in those properties, right? Otherwise, you're going to get much less than that. Okay. And then um, alongside that, a relatively healthy you know, ETF uh, stock investment portfolio, maybe in somewhere in the order of half a million, um, 600,000, something like that, where uh, you know a million dollars worth of my net worth is in uh, real estate and cash flowing um, positions. And then the rest of it is in investments that I can either draw from or just let ride. That's awesome. Most people can't answer that question. Yeah, I love that you've thought about that. Um, as you were telling your story, and specifically with regards to your income, you said that income, uh, salary kind of steadily increases, but bonuses have a much higher opportunity for increase. Uh, have you talked to your boss about how to position yourself for a larger bonus? Like, how does the company evaluate bonus compensation? What can you do to make sure you're getting the most bonus that you could possibly get every single year? Because salary doesn't sound like there's a lot of opportunity for growth. Yeah. So uh, the answer to the bonus question is essentially ascend in pay grade. So um, when you ascend in pay levels, we have uh, very clear kind of uh, rubrics for what pay levels look like and the bonuses associated with them. So there's always a pay range for each level um, and then assigned bonuses that go with them. Um, I won't disclose the percentages of those uh, just as a matter of uh, keeping it private for my employer. Um, but those things as ascend pretty significantly as you go into uh, more of the uh, vice president kind of role types. Um, you get into very significant compensation where um, potentially half of your yearly income can come from something like a bonus. Okay. So is there anything that you can do to accelerate that if you plan on staying at this specific company? Uh, essentially for my company, a, a lot of career advancement is based around uh, breadth of experience rather than depth of experience. Uh, this is just my personal uh, viewpoint of, of how I see the firm. Folks that move around a lot within the firm and have a, a wide breadth of experience uh, tend to move up. Um, because you can kind of jump from side to side and do the kind of the, the career twister, as I call it, or you just kind of move from spot to spot. Whereas if you try and be super deep at, say, software engineer, um, the, the career path is very linear, which is great, but it doesn't ascend as high as potentially something on the business side where you can kind of go back and forth between what you're doing, um, do something in investments, do something in risk, do something in product development, that sort of thing. Okay. So it sounds like you're aware of what you need to do to qualify for those extra bonuses. Um, you mentioned two years in your house and potentially moving to a different state. When did you purchase the house? I purchased the house in August of 2020. August of 2020. So, oh, so you have actually been in there for two whole years. Um, just to reiterate, that is the magic number for paying no capital gains taxes when you go to sell. What did you purchase the house for? 350. And what do you think it's worth now? It's about, uh, I would conservatively say like 460. A few months back, there was one or two units in my development that sold for 500. Um, but with interest rates coming down, the last one I saw, I think, was like 475. So let's just say 460 for sake of argument. Okay. So that's still a nice chunk of change. One thing to consider moving to another state that has no income tax is that they re recuperate that with sales tax, 
property tax, um, a lot of other ways to to tax. So do some research before you pull up and move to a different state simply to save on income tax. You could find yourself um, not saving anything over time. And you, I hear people listening right now saying, he's got a 3.125% interest rate on his house. Don't sell it. It might be worth it to sell it and move to a different place because you don't make a lot of purchases, your property tax would be lower, or you don't buy a house, you simply rent, and then you're not paying property tax at all. Um, what do rents go for in the area that you're thinking about moving? If you are paying $2,000 a month for your condo, and then you would move to a place where you're paying $2,000 a month in rent, maybe it doesn't really make sense to move. Maybe it does. You sound like uh, you know your way around a spreadsheet I would throw some of these numbers into a spreadsheet and really dive into that. Um, moving, like how far away would this move be? I'm not familiar with the north. So uh, I could go as, as close as New Hampshire, so 20 miles for me. Or I could go as far as somewhere like Florida or Texas. Um, you know, I think no sales tax and places where my company has um, satellite offices. You know, all three of those are potential um, spots. What would you want to do with your current house? Is your instinct to keep it or to sell it when you move? So my instinct when I bought this place was to, uh, if I, as I moved on, I would keep this and rent it. Uh, but with the current payment and HOA, I'm not sure that that sort of thing would cash flow. It would be close. Um, I would have to really look into things like how my utilities work out, um, insurance on a rental property like umbrella insurance and things like that would work out to um in order to figure out if it would cash flow i would say it's very close um but my instinct was to to keep it unless i just found an opportunity where hey you know my girlfriend who someday hopefully will become my wife um just happened to find our dream home and the only way to make it happen is that um we need the equity from the home in order to make that happen now of course there is cash out refi um but I'm, I'm kind of not banking on that in the near term based on the fact that interest rates are high and um, it doesn't seem like the best financial decision to make given the interest rate that I have. You're in cash, cash out refinancing this place for several years in any, in any, any meaningful effect at least. Um, that makes sense. Um, you're thinking about moving. Um, I learned about this today, this morning, from an, 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 uh, uh, an expert on the subject. Um, this concept of assumable mortgages – if you have an FHA mortgage or a VA or a USDA loan, these are eligible for assumption. So you could you, – someone buying your property because it, you purchase it with an FHA loan could simply assume your mortgage. If you wanted to sell it to somebody, they would have to come up with the, the cash difference there. But assuming that they qualified and met the qualifications of the loan, uh, they could just simply take over the payments for you and, and assign that. And that that would be an option available to you as well. That could be a powerful tool to to lean into or learn about when you make this move. The issue on your end as well uh, that it will will be if you want to buy a four hundred thousand dollar property, then you will need and 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 the, the FHA loan. Let's let's make this up um, is three hundred grand on that property. You need to come up with a hundred thousand dollars to pay the difference. You can do that with your own cash. You can do it with debt, um, but you can't get another mortgage from like Fannie Mae to, br to bridge that gap. So because of that, uh, and because you don't want to keep this property, that lean makes me lean towards selling this property soon, whenever you, whenever you move, um, taking that cash and then potentially exploring something like this. I think it's a really powerful way to house hack right now. And this would be kind of where I'd be looking if I was looking to build to re, to start my, my portfolio from scratch uh, in a new state, I would probably be looking. Okay, are there duplexes in particular? Are there single families? Are there are there multifamily properties that have an FHA or VA loan that I can where I can maybe assume that mortgage that's got a low interest rate? That's a dramatic change in in purchasing power or cash flow on that property. Um, as long as you can come up with the cash to cover the spread. What, what's your reaction to that? I really like that. Uh Something that I've also heard that you can do is through an assumable mortgage, let's say they have you know 50% equity in the place and you can't come up with 250,000. Um, there is 
potentially um, options out there where you can get a a second like to cover the difference mortgage where you still have 25% equity so I'd be putting 100,000 down but as a way to kind of bridge the gap between what the assumed mortgage would be and the shortfall would be you can kind of do a, a essentially a bridge loan um, without the balloon payment so, uh, traditionally that a comp- company is a bridge loan that will come with a very ex- a very high interest rate 10 easily 10 plus percent interest um, which will make which will make your decisions very easy, right? So you buy the property, and then you don't have to worry about investing for a year or two while you pay off the the bridge debt. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right. So I have considered something like that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I I really just don't have enough knowledge in that sort of area, which is one of my homework assignments over the next six months. Scott, I really like one of the things that you talked about in a recent podcast around take you know three months. You know, four times a year, take three months, figure something out uh, where you really want to dive deep on it. And that's one of the things that I want to do is, is dive into assumable mortgages, um, duplexes, multifamilies, and figure out uh, where is the cash flow, at what at what um, equity rate is there a cash flow, and then start to target that as kind of like a cash position that I can, tar- you know, essentially try and reach in order to put myself in a position to be ready to pull the trigger when the, when the moment strikes. Great. A, a quick aside about assumable mortgages based on what I learned today is my understanding is that, uh, again, they only apply to VA, FHA, and USDA loans, and you must occupy the property uh, in order to uh, in order to do that. So I, I, I imagine, again, I'm, I'm, I'm still new to this, but I imagine that that has a one-year requirement of living in the property when you do that. So it's not a, a tool available to investors. There are other tools like Subject2 um, that inv- an investor who's not going to occupy the property could use. Um, but that makes it powerful. Now, with the VA loan, if you are not a veteran and you assume a VA loans, a VA loan, then that uh, veteran loses some, at least some of the entitlement for using another VA loan, right? Um, there is probably nuance there that I'm, I'm not, I'm not stating correctly, but know that that will be a disadvantage to a non-veteran. So, um, something, something to think about there. Okay. So we've, we've talked about, we've talked about the, this, when, when would you like to make the move? So that's the thing we, myself and my girlfriend don't really have a timeline. Uh, she is a nurse. Um, she's very good pay for the purposes of, of this episode, you know, just kind of putting that sort of thing aside, like her pay and her benefits. Um, there is the potential for her to do travel nursing. Uh, she's not huge on that sort of idea. The idea being, if you live 50 miles away from where you're working, you can get travel nurse pay, which significantly increases the amount of pay that you get. Um, so for us, like moving to New Hampshire, moving 30 miles away, she would be able to get travel nurse pay, but then she has to commute 50 miles. So, you know, there's that sort of thing. Um, but the, uh, the timeline for us would probably be in the two to five year sort of time frame, rather than more of the more immediate, like one to two years, um, just as a matter of one cash flow, um, two career establishment, and uh, three potential family, you know, things like getting married, having children, that sort of thing. Okay. Well, I would I would consider reconsider that stance with the property. Um, even if you don't move away, if you just move down the block and get a better rental property, um, you're going to be, you're going to be making the biggest, this is the biggest, most actionable step inside of the next six months that I can see to moving you towards that portfolio you just described in a future state. If you could sell this property and reposition the equity into another property that was a better rental for, for this, for, 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 you know, some sort of investment, some sort of house hack. Um, so I, I would just encourage you to think that th- through. If it's not, if it's truly not an option, we will go th- to other parts of your portfolio um, with this. And I, so I, I think the next area I would explore is your cash allocation uh, decision. So we, we, we understand the goal. We want to back into one and a half million dollars with a million in real estate equity and 500,000 in, in stocks spread across tax advantaged and after tax brokerage accounts. Is that, am I stating that correctly? Okay. So that's a heavy, heavy, heavy real estate portfolio. It also sounds to me, um, you know, we're not, we're not going to be conservative. We're going to be realistic about this. It sounds to me like you're going to advance in your company and you're going to get larger and larger bonus potential in future years. So you're going to have disproportionate back at back loaded income in this. To me, that suggests get the cash out of these retirement accounts now, build it up in your in your per, in your your position, your cash position right now, and continue to be aggressive about the real estate stuff right now. You want your portfolio to be two thirds real estate, 
um, and one third stocks, you're going to have an opportunity to back end, backload the stocks, I think. Um, but it's going to be really hard to accumulate. It's going to be really hard to max out those retirement accounts now and have significant amounts of cash with which to buy real estate lightly leveraged later. You want to buy that real estate now, fix it up, add equity, pay, and start amortizing those loans today if you want to back into that future portfolio. Mindy is grimacing here. So what do you think, Mindy? I don't like – I know I, I can hide this really well. I don't like the idea of pulling any money out that is already oh, in no. there. I, do not pull any money out. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I, okay. I, I thought that's what you were suggesting is take sorry. the penalty. Yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting stopping the flow into the, the retirement accounts beyond any obvious wins like 401k match and putting that instead into purpose-driven real estate investment. Okay. So I will pull back my grimace a little bit and and – sort of agree and sort of not agree. So I think we're all on the same page. If your company offers any sort of match, absolutely contribute all that you can to get 100% of that match. I like contributing to the HSA as long as you can because early retirement is in your plans and you make a decent salary and I am assuming because you didn't say that you have large medical bills, I am assuming that you are in relatively good health, you are dating a nurse, I am assuming that you have very low medical expenses. You you cash flow those as you can and you contribute, you max out your HSA as much as possible while saving receipts for the random band-aids and contact solution and prescription and every once in a while you go to the doctor for whatever. Save those receipts up while you have the HSA, and then as soon as you no longer have access to the HSA, you can cash in those receipts. You don't have to cash them in the same year that you use them. You can also just let it grow, and then I want to say it's 55 or 59, you can start just pulling that money out as it's like an extra tax-free retirement account. Um, the Mad Scientist has an awesome article about the HSA being the best retirement account on the planet or something like that. Um, I would continue to contribute to a Roth IRA. I like the Roth IRA, especially at your age. It's going to grow tax-free and help fund your post-retirement accounts. Um, plus, the limit for contributions is $6,000 this year. I think it goes up to $6,500 next year, but don't quote me. Um, the I, I still love contributing to a a retirement account, but if you want to be so heavy in real estate, building up your cash position, putting feelers out, you mentioned Texas and Florida, those are going to be less expensive than the uh, Northeast. And you could get some really great cash flowing properties there. Um, start looking into those areas and keeping an eye on the market and seeing what's happening. I mean, you've got $30,000 in cash right now. Maybe some amazing property comes up that m is worth buying. You deplete your cash position because you know you can replenish it simply by stopping your contributions to your retirement accounts, and you, you know, jump in on a smoking hot deal. I wouldn't jump in on a mediocre deal, but I would definitely jump in on a smoking hot deal. Remy, uh, how much cash could you accumulate if you didn't do anything with your retirement accounts? How much? How much? How much incremental cash would would you be able to generate after tax? Probably like in the order of twenty thousand a year or something like that. Okay, 20. that's that's just extra, by the way. Like, uh, so like on top of whatever cash position that I could create through income with the way I contribute contribute now, I'm saying an extra twenty thousand. And how how much total cash would that be with, with if you combine both? Oh, um, probably like thirty five in a year, or something like that. Thirty, thirty five. Okay, thirty five a year. Um, that allows you to buy one property in your area every two years with, if you find a really good deal, maybe two and a half years with 25% down. Yeah. Probably, probably more like three years. Cause we're looking at like for a 25% down anywhere in the area, 
you're looking at like 400,000 as a minimum, unless you just like get a real beat up property and you can do everything. I have a little bit of handiness where I can, I can do some things myself, but like st big structural things where you would get that smoking hot deal as somebody who would understand how to do that thing. That is not me. Great. So that puts us at three, four, maybe four properties a a in 10 years. I'm going to give you a little bit of credit that you're going to income is going to expand over that time period. It's not going to be static with this. So that, that, that gets us pretty close to, to your goal, but probably closer to 500,000, maybe 700,000 in equity, not a million in equity. If you repair them or do something creative or house hack, you're going to get there faster. So we've got the tools to get to, we, to back into that in a reasonable sense. I think I agree with Mindy based on that. Uh, we can slow that a little bit, especially again, if you're willing to do something with your primary residence and take the match, take the HSA, max the HSA, and max the max the Roth, that's going to pull out eight grand between the Roth, nine grand between the Roth and the HSA, and then a few more thousand pre-tax with the 401k contribution. So I, I, I like that. that. That'll slow you a little bit, but that still gives you the 70-30 the of the accumulation of, uh, is going on after tax in a way that can help your real estate portfolio. Also, no, knowing the little I know about you, I, I wonder if having cash after tax is going to make you feel somewhat uncomfortable um, and give you a little bit of sense of urgency to deploy that cash because it's because you're, you know, you're missing the opportunity cost of being able to put it into these retirement accounts. That's, that's definitely it. I, opportunity cost for me is huge. Um, and, and sitting on cash for, you know, two years, as much as I like to think I have the behavioral uh, mindset to be able to do that sort of thing. I do see the opportunity cost of, hey, I could just put this in the market. And that's one of the things that I've considered is, okay, do I just accumulate this this uh, money in an after-tax brokerage account, um, put it in a 60-40 blend um, or a 50-50 blend and let it ride? And if it happens and you know it catches lightning in a bottle and it accumulates 20% in the next three years and I come out on the, on the upside, then great. And if it... Um, and if it comes out on the downside and I lose 20% over the next three years and it comes out on the downside and it takes me an extra year to go toward that real estate investing route, is, is that something I'm okay with as well? I, I think that's sort of where I'm trending with it. Uh, what say you? I love that question. And my honest answer is I, at 26, in your shoes, I would have put it in the brokerage account. Most people are going to gasp in horror and say, you can't do that um, with that. But like, I would have said... I'm here to play a mathematical game that's going to advance me toward financial independence as rapidly as possible. This is not going to bankrupt me. It can, it's only going to either accelerate or decelerate my progress towards that goal. So I'm going to play the, I'm going to, I'm going to play the odds in the way that I think are, are the best to get me there and accept that two years out of 10, I'm going to have a major setback on that and bad luck and bad timing. And the other eight years, I'm probably going to get some good return on that. That's my honest answer. Um, a lot of po po folks will disagree and I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage everyone to do that for sure. But I am going to tag off of Scott and say the same thing. I have many buckets from which to pull if I needed a rapid infusion of catch, and not the least of which is a series of credit cards that I can swipe and buy myself a month of time to figure it out. So even though I host this money podcast and tell everybody they need to have an emergency fund, I currently have as much in my emergency fund as Scott has in my emergency fund, which is zero. I don't have an emergency fund at all. And that's because I have access to funds in many different ways. If you also have access to funds, I mean, what is an emergency fund for? It's for an emergency. If all four tires on my car, and I just changed my tires this weekend from my regular to my snow tires, and two of them have like metal sticking out of the tire, like they're bald in ways that kind of frightened me when I pulled it off. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a problem. I need to change that. I can go and buy new tires. I can afford that. I can just... I have a job that's going to pay my credit card bill and I'm going to swipe it and it's going to take me 30 days to pay that off. Um, so I don't have emergencies because I I have a lot of buckets to pull from. I, I do have an emergency reserve, but I, it's not an emergency reserve that's setting me up for my next investment. It's my emergency reserve. You have cash just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for you to spend it? Correct. Oh, 
Okay. I do that. And I love your approach. But personally, I have a large pile of cash, a year and a half, two years of expenses sitting there doing nothing for that. Remy has six months, eight months, nine months sitting there doing that. That's great. And I have zero. Um, you, you pick a number you're comfortable with for that. And everything on top of that, that is going to go toward that next real estate investment. I, I wouldn't have a problem. It's just a, it's a matter of your risk tolerance and how you want to play it. Um, I wouldn't have a problem sticking that all into your after-tax brokerage account and being ready to pull from that. You will pay, make sure you count for gains. If you, if it, things do go up, um, you will have to, you have to, uh, pay, pay tax on those gains. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would be, that would be fine. And the way I'm wired, <clears throat> I can't stand a bad bet. Um, so it's, it's, I can, I can, I can lose money. I just can't live with being not, not doing what I think is a reasonably optimized approach. The cash I have sitting there that's doing nothing to me is optimized because that is, that is my reserve. That's my cushion. I don't have to worry about my entire investment portfolio at any given point in time because I can just draw down on my cash position. Now, is that your personal or is that your business emergency reserve? There, that is my personal. Um, and it waxes and wanes a little bit as I plan for tax payments throughout the year. Okay. So here are three different approaches. And I think it's important to note that I have access to other funds. That's why I don't have an emergency fund. Um, If you don't have access to any other funds, if you don't have, I mean, I'm 50 years old. I have lots of credit and I have lots of, I mean, if really, really worst came to worst, I could call my mother and say, mom, can I borrow some money until next month? Like I've set myself up in such a way that I should say we, cause it's my husband too, but we have set ourselves up in such a way that we are able to pull from a bunch of different spots. So we do put all of our money into the stock market um, or real estate. But if that's not you, then I think an emergency fund is a great position. Also, can you sleep if you don't have any emergency fund? I, I could sleep. Uh, I wouldn't feel as comfortable. Uh, one of the biggest things that I keep the emergency fund around for is like, uh, you know, I have a, a house that was built in 1986. And one of the things that I just had to do is replace a furnace, you know, $7,000. It's not exactly a cheap, cheap thing to have happen. Um, so, you know, maybe that doesn't justify having $30,000 hanging around, but, um, you know, that sort of thing does help me a little bit. Just thinking about, uh, from a comfort perspective, having a little bit of extra money around does make sense for me. Uh, making sure that I can cover anything that comes up, uh, in, you know, just my regular checking accounts, um, is something that's important to me. Uh, so that's why I keep the, the kind of the hefty, uh, cash reserve, but you know, it is, it is a decent thought exercise to say, how could I more optimize that? Um, cause I, even I've thought about, Hey, $30,000 first, my, my job is relatively secure. Um, I have income coming in from other ways that I could ramp up if I wanted to, in terms of like the side gig, I, I could, um, start to ramp that up. Um, so there's, there's opportunities for me to be able to cover shortfalls. If that sort of thing were to happen, um, it wouldn't happen right away, but it would be, um, you know, having a $15,000 cash position instead of a $30,000 cash position wouldn't ch- fundamentally change the way that I think about my finances, but it could put me in a better position to optimize how I deploy that cash. Yeah. I think it's remarkably silly to take all this money and throw it into the stock market and then be anxiety ridden every minute until you can build it back up. Uh, But if you do this thought exercise and, and really think about it, talk about it with your girlfriend, if it's, you know, things are getting serious and you're talking about marriage, talk about money with her too. How do you feel about this? Oh, I think that's really silly. We should have 15. You know what? I've done the math. 15 feels good. Let's take 15 and put it someplace else. Or, hey, it really gives me anxiety if we have, if we have less than six months. Okay, then we'll keep the 30. It's not like we're talking about you have $500,000 in cash sitting there that could be doing so much more, but it's something to think about how much are you comfortable with and just you know, putting putting thought into your finances. It doesn't have to consume every minute of your day, like some of us nerds, but. In your situation, your plan is to work your job for the next 10 years. If you told us, I want to quit in three or begin looking at other options and moving, moving my business, you know, exploring entrepreneurial pursuits, you should be building up a way bigger cash position um, or that the 30 or, or, or more. 
but I, I'd feel totally comfortable in your situation of, of bringing that down and putting more of it in, in the market. If, if, if you're really confident in your, in your five, 10 year plan here and you're like, you know, great, I'm going to have work the stable job. I'm going to have good cash flow. Um, then to me, I, I, you know, my, my thoughts would be thinking about how do I deploy more of it? Not, and it's not a big deal. It's just, a, it's, it, it's a, it's a percentage in, in, in your thing. The big moves are going to be what you do with your primary residence and how soon you do it. Um, and where you, where you accumulate, uh, you put your cash and make in, in making that next and, and how fast you can make that next, the second big real estate decision. First one being, being your primary. Those are the big moves. I think the big levers. And then, yeah, I think you got some, you can keep controlling your expenses and keep advancing at your career. Um, but this is, this is a good plan. You're, you're, you're in a, you're in a good spot and I think you can achieve what you want to do as long as you make the big asset allocation decisions and then roll the dice those, those three, four times with those, those properties. And Mindy, I wanted to come back to your thoughts on the miscellaneous, uh, you know, expense line. So here's why I put 500 ish with a question mark. Um, it tends to be kind of a, not a revolving door, but just kind of like a musical chairs of, of what it's going to be this month. Like as an example, October, I had two weddings. So there's $700 in wedding gifts in October. Um, uh, let's see in July, there was home insurance bill. Uh, I'm sorry, in the car insurance bill. So that covered, uh, that, that budgeted line item. Um, so as far as like monthly expenses, I, I budget that monthly expense as part of that 500 ish per month, um, as a way to just kind of like even it out as the, as the ride throughout the year. Okay. Uh, that tells me that you've thought about it, which I like a whole lot more than, oh, I don't really want to look at this expense, so I'll just put that in miscellaneous. I think some people who aren't so thoughtful about their expenses are just shoving things in miscellaneous. I've seen $1,000 in miscellaneous. I'm like, that's too much money in miscellaneous. That $1,000 can get categorized. $10, $50 is just like random. Oh, I know I had 50 bucks, but I don't know what I spent it on. That's miscellaneous. That's probably not going to kill your budget, but 500 tends to be a little bit, but you're thinking about it. And that's as long as you have a good answer, that's all I need. I think if you don't have that assumption for the unknowns in your budget, they're going to derail your budget. So I love it. Well, Remy, um, hopefully, was it, was this helpful for you? It was. Yeah. It gave me some, some things to think about, especially around how I allocate my cash, what to think about over the next year or so um, gave me some some things to think about as I approach um, how I want to set up next year and then thinking about 2024 as well because um, it sounds like 2023 is going to be largely spent accumulating a cash position or or some sort of uh, money position that allows me to to do some real estate investing and then 2024 is probably the year where it starts to get deployed awesome well, I'm glad that was helpful. Thank you for, for sharing um, uh, your numbers and your story with us. Uh, I think this has been really, really illustrative. You've got a, a classic set of challenges that I think a lot of folks have um, in the context of a really strong f uh, financial foundation. You're just at this, you're just at this point where you've got to make trade-off decisions at the highest level in big ways to shape that future portfolio. And the fact that you've thought about it and have the strength, the strong position you have right now, um, is is fantastic. You're in, you're in a great spot. Yep. Absolutely. I agree with Scott 100%. And I look forward to next year when you reach back out to give me an update so we can see where you're at. Yeah, definitely. I would love to, to reach out and, and be pen pals about you know decisions that I'm making or, or things that I'm interested in. I'd love to make sure that one, I'm not doing anything stupid. And then uh, secondly, I'm uh, uh, you know just updating you guys on the success. I don't think you're doing anything stupid. Yep. Uh, that, that, that is unlikely. Okay, well, it's Mindy at BiggerPockets.com and Scott at BiggerPockets.com. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Remy, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, thank you so much. All right, that was Remy and Scott. I think Remy has a very good financial situation. What I love about him telling his story is that he has thought about a lot of his a lot of the aspects of his financial situation. He doesn't just throw money into a miscellaneous category because he doesn't want to think about it. It's a conscious decision. He's putting money away for his retirement. He's thinking about real estate. He's thinking about other things. He's doing things consciously. And that's the best kind of financial story we can talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think Remy's doing a lot of really good things. I do think that his situation illuminates a trap, the, the middle-class trap in this country. And he's not going to fall into it. 
Um, but where he's at is the guy essentially genera- – he generates some cash flow. He's got a good emergency reserve. But most of his wealth is getting funneled into his home equity and to his retirement accounts right now. And that's great. Uh, that's a responsible position. That's what the normal is here um, in, in America for a lot of folks. But the problem is that if, he, if that is carried out, then in 10 years, his wealth, he's going to be a millionaire – but with all that wealth in retirement accounts, some cash left over, and then a bunch of home equity that he can't really harness in any meaningful degree to, to have freedom in his life. And so, again, to break that, we constantly, you know, we hear this all the time in the Bigger Pockets Money podcast and with a lot of different financial positions. And you probably, uh, you listening, probably see it with friends, family, maybe in your own lives, that situation happening because it's so automatic and such big chunks of money go into it. $19,000 per year in your 401k, 6000 in your Roth, thirty five, thirty six hundred dollars $3,600 into your HSA. It's very easy to then have nothing left over for the vast, vast majority of America, if you're even privileged enough to be able to max out those items. And then the left little left over that is being accumulated is going to go towards a small emergency reserve and then the the, the home, uh, the, the, the primary residence mortgage. And that's it. And, and that's what, what I think we're trying to break here at, at BP Money is we don't want that outcome. Um, that's that's th- that's going to take you 30, 40 years to really realize the benefits of those decisions and have some flexibility at the tail end. Let's have that flexibility much, much earlier in life uh, and be able to, to do things that we want to do and have control, uh, be able to make decisions like starting a business, taking multiple years off, um, start doing something entrepreneurial or investing in real estate. I agree with that with an asterisk at the top. Take advantage of the opportunities that you can only take advantage of while you are employed, like the Roth IRA. You can only contribute to a Roth IRA when you have earned income. I really like the Roth IRA plan. I like it for everybody, but I really, really, really like it for the younger people because it grows tax-free and because you have such an amazing opportunity to have vast sums of wealth And you can only contribute $6,000 this year. That's $500 a month. If you back that out, that's $125 a week, $25 a day. You can contribute a lot to your future wealth by contributing to a Roth. And it caps off after a certain income. It just makes a lot of sense when you're young to contribute to a Roth. The HSA plan, I love for so many reasons. If you are in good health, Uh, Even if you're not in good health, the HSA plan, having a high deductible plan can be a great plan if you are financially stable and can uh, financially secure, I guess stable is not the right word, uh, and can contribute to and cash flow the expenses that you are incurring now. You can just, it's like an extra retirement account. But like you said, Scott, so many people we talk to have these large 401k plans and then nothing in the after tax brokerage accounts or, you know, real estate or whatever their their easily accessible before retirement age accounts that they choose. So yeah, I think I I love Remy for thinking about it in advance. And Mindy, I, I can hear what you're saying and I understand it. I just with with folks that are starting in their careers. And, you know, Remy, Remy's, Remy's kind of like almost in a, in a midpoint for, you know, the average American in the career, like 9,000 a month is a really good income uh, with that. But he's, he's still in a position where that eight grand, nine grand that goes to the HSA and then the Roth and another maybe four, I'm making this up, I don't know how much it would be for his 401k match. Um, that hurts. That's, that's like a third of his cash accumulation for the year, right? For a year, eaten up right there. That makes a dramatic impact on his ability to invest in that next real estate investment or build up that emergency reserve for those types of things. And it hurts even more if your total cash accumulation is going to be ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and now you're sucking up sixty five percent of that. And so that's where I think that that uh, that real that gut check or that really hard decision exists for so many people out there of making that conscious choice about. Where, what do I want that portfolio to look like in a few years? And how am I going to make the very painful trade-offs of taking advantage of these great accounts you just mentioned or actually building flexibility right now for, for opportunities I can't even see yet? 
and and that's that's I think I want I just want to make people aware of that hard choice because it's so easy to just say yeah let's do the HSA let's take the four hundred one k match let's put the Roth IRA I agree with those things if your position is such that you can accumulate enough cash to max all those things out and still have plenty left over and you're that priv- you're privileged with that with that level of income and the low expenses to be able to do that then yeah you go down that list. For most people, though, you're going to have to make, again, those really painful trade-offs, and there are they're just decisions to make that I want to make people aware of, and there are consequences to not making those decisions and putting all the money in those places. Yes, and I think that it's great to bring those up, and people should be contributing consciously and not just, oh, well, this is what I should do. This is what I should do. I just – I really like the these tax-free accounts – the the uh, the the four hundred one k and the traditional accounts where you're reducing your taxable income are great, but I really like the tax free growth that some of these other ones provide for the younger. And you know, it you don't have to max them out forever, but just getting a few years in at the beginning of your working career and just watching it grow. I mean that. That tax-free growth, because after it's been in there for five years, you can withdraw the the principal. You can withdraw the principal for several purchases, including housing, medical bills, housing, and I think college at any time. But you can withdraw the principal after five years just for living expenses. So there are it, it is accessible before your retirement, traditional retirement age. It's just the tax-free growth is just not something you get very frequently. I agree. Well, I'd love to hear um, folks' thoughts on this. Let's make it a discussion topic uh, in our BP Money Facebook group, which is can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash BP Money. Awesome. I will post that in the Facebook group at eight o'clock on the day that this episode comes out. All right, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. That wraps up this episode of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. He is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen saying catch you on the rebound. <laughs> 